All right, everybody. Um, welcome to my presentation on trees. So um, in the blockchain space, I hope most of you are pretty familiar with Merkle trees in general and their constructions and their variants. But uh, in this talk, we're just kind of gonna run over um, a couple, like we're gonna go over append only Merkle trees, sparse Merkle trees, index Merkle trees, the trees that did exist in Asset Connect and what they were for. And then we're gonna go over the trees well, very briefly, the trees that are in ASIC 3 and what we use them for and why they're important. So first of all, just a rough overview of what a Merkle tree is. The great thing about a Merkle tree is that it's you can think of it as just a data structure that allows you to store arbitrary data, but then allows you to make proofs against data that exists within your data structure. So in this example, it's just ripped from Google, it's the one that I think everyone's really seen. If I have data L1, data L2, data L3, and data L4, um, we hash, all, hash them together all the way up to the root, and then I can provide a proof that L1 exists in the tree by providing a hash of L1, and then proving, providing a path that brings me to the root. The idea being is that your hashes are some kind of random oracle, well, they're sufficiently random, so, the, the idea is that it, it would be impossible for you to provide a hash path that would get to the hash at the root of the tree if you didn't actually know what data was in the tree. Um, so that's kind of the assumption that underlies um, Merkle trees, and it's just the assumption that underlies all hash functions in general. So a key data structure within, I suppose, all private state applications is the idea of an append-only Merkle tree. And the reason that we have an append-only Merkle tree is if you look at Ethereum state, where everything's kind of stored in, these things are called patrician Merkle trees, but we can kind of think of them in the same sense. If I have a piece of data here and I want to change it, if I were to update the data in this index, I kind of leak to everyone that, oh, there's this piece of data here that I'm changing. And it was also changed in a transaction ages ago and let's say somebody can then link these two transactions together and that's kind of what you don't want so the idea for state inside um, applications which have private state is that we just have a merkle tree that we only append to so a piece of data gets added during a transaction and that's just like this one here at the end and the rest of the tree just remains completely unchanged. So that's what these two colors are for. So we have the immutable part of the tree on the left. And then whenever we insert this leaf here, we basically add a new node here. We add, update this node and we update this node, but everything else to the last stays um, unchanged. So as I said earlier, a great property of Merkle trees is that we can do a membership proof. So I can prove to you that a piece of data exists in the tree and I don't have to run through every single node in the tree to go check where it is. You can just provide me something that's known as a hash path. So what's also great is in this hash path, if you can think of it as, if I want to get to this root, I take the hash of this value and this value that will bring me to this value and then hash this value and this value brings me to this value and then hash this value and this value that brings me to the root. I can calculate these two um, as I'm going. So whenever you're providing the proof, you only have to provide these outside nodes because I can actually derive the data in between. So to, as I've just said, to do a membership proof and then take these values, hash them together, and then hash these two values together, and hash these two values together, and then I end up with my root. And there we are, happy days. So, how do I do a non-membership proof? And we'll go over shortly why these, why we want these non-membership proofs, um, or just right now. The idea being, if in these private state trees, if I want to spend a note that exists within the tree, I then have a nullifier tree, which we use to delete that piece of data. So the way we delete a piece of data is by deterministically linking something in the nullifier tree, so in the data tree. So if I go all the way back, oh, oops. If I was to want to delete this piece of information here, I would want to create a leaf in the nullifier tree, which 
is derived from this. To make sure I can't spend it twice, I first have to check that the nullifier doesn't exist. So go back to the section where I was in. So how do I check that this doesn't exist? In an independently tree, it's really difficult. So the idea is, well, you can do it, but it's just extremely wasteful. I basically need to check every single node in the tree to check that it isn't, isn't the data. So enter a new data structure called a sparse Merkle tree. And the idea of a sparse Merkle tree is we, instead of adding leaves into the next available index, we add leaves into the node at which, at the key of the index that they represent. So for example, if I was to insert the value four into my tree, I would put it at index four instead of putting it at the very beginning. And at the beginning, everything is set to null or zero or whatever, whatever you choose. So in, in this case, you can see that at index zero, if I was to hash zero with some imaginary hash function, I'll end up with this value 42, or if I was to hash two, I get 96. But at every key that's empty, so one doesn't exist within this tree, so at this node, we store null. Three doesn't exist in this tree, so at this node, we store null. Four doesn't exist, six doesn't exist. And you can probably see how we can prove something doesn't exist. It's basically by proving that the node at a particular index is actually null and doesn't have some known hash value at it. So I want to prove that null isn't in, one isn't in there. I prove that null is at the is at the index one. And then I do my inclusion proof that I was doing already. And if I get to the root, I can be confident that the value one doesn't exist. So in private state applications, if I was to have a let's say an Ethereum where all values are 256 bits. For to represent 256 values in a sparse Merkle tree, I'm going to need 256 levels. So you can see in this tree, I can only represent a possible of eight values, which can be represented with um, four bits. So I have three levels and then the root at the top. And for if we were to represent a 32 byte word, so something is 256 bits, I would need 256 levels. And you can kind of see already that if I was to try and do an all membership proof for something that's 256 levels deep, I'm having to do 256 hashes. And that's a lot, especially to do it inside a circuit. And especially in the case where if I want to do a non membership proof, I first have to. Well, if I want to insert something in the tree, I have to do a non-membership proof to prove that it doesn't exist there already, and then update the root after that I've inserted the value. That means that I'm, I'm having to do actually 512 hashes, um, which is an extraordinary amount to be doing, well, on Ethereum or inside a circuit or anywhere. It's incredibly expensive. So this is where a new data structure comes in, and it's called the index Merkle tree. So an index Merkle tree is an extension of a pendently Merkle tree that allows for efficient non-membership checks. So I'll get into how it does that very shortly, but it allows for us, the, the, the key advantage is that it allows for us to shrink the size of the tree. We no longer need to represent every key at the index that it represents. So I don't have to store the value two to the 128 at index two to the 128 in my tree. I can just add it like it's an append only tree, but still be able to perform a non-membership check. And the way it does it is very simple. We extend the tree such that it stores a value, the next value, so the next largest value in the tree, so this is really a pointer, and then the index of the next value in the tree. So we can think of it that, well, we'll, we'll go through an example very shortly, but if everything has been inserted correctly, the number, anything between value and next value will not exist in the tree. Because if I have the value 10 
here and the next value here is 20, then I know that all of the values between 10 and 20, so 11 through 19, don't actually exist within the tree. And the way I provide a non-membership check is just by proving that the node that has 10 here and 20 here exists within the tree. And we'll get to this shortly. It's quite hard to think about without it being visualized. So let's say I have an empty tree here. As you can see, each leaf now consists of three data points. So we have the value itself and then two pointers. So this is the initial state. If I was to insert 30, I basically put 30 into the tree in the next available index. I then lit, update my, this is what's called the low pointer node to point to 30. So the next value is 30 and the next index is one. So now you can kind of see that if I have a, a node that looks like this, where I have zero as the value and 30 as the next value, I can be pretty certain that any, if I can provide a membership proof for this, I can be certain that the values zero through 29 do not exist within the tree. And this kind of carries on as you insert values. So if I insert 10, as you can see, 10 just goes into the next available slot. I then have, so I will then point, oh, this hasn't been updated yet, it's a mistake. So what would happen is I point the next value at this one, which should be 10, and then this one here points at 30. So you can see that the pointer from the first leaf changed to be the one on the second leaf. Oh, now if I was to insert, oh wait, this is all wrong. <laughs> Bruno. Yes. I ripped these from an article that Michael had written and I've just realized that this should be 10 everywhere on this 20. That's okay. Um, I think so, we can, we should be able to, let me just cut this real quick. So well. with index yeah, those trees, we have this new data structure that gets stored at every leaf. And every leaf is the hash of everything in this data structure. So you basically will um, concatenate value next and next, next value together, and then hash them together to get your leaf value. But I'll tell you what value next and next and next value actually are. So if we have, let's say the value 10, that value, and it's index zero, well, index one, let's say, and the next value is 20, and it's at index one. We can then be certain that in between 10 and 20, nothing actually exists, because if, let's say, 15 was in the tree, then the next value would actually be 15. Um, so you can be certain that from value to the next value that there will be nothing in there. So if I can provide a membership proof for let's say the example I gave, which was 10, 0, and 20, what, 10, 1, 20, I can be sure that I can use that as the non-membership proof for values 9, 11 through 19. Um, quite hard to, to understand just by me saying it, so I'm going to give a demonstration of doing some insertions here. So this is what the initial tree will look like. As you can see, every single leaf will have a lot more data stored in it. So we'll have all these pointers and the value itself. So I'm going to insert first the value of 30 into the tree. So we have this special leaf that will always exist at the start, which will have value zero. And the reason for that um, I'll talk about right now is you always have to have the lowest value in your possible set of numbers existing in the tree. So in our case, it'll be a set of field elements or whatever you need it to be, like let's say a set of real numbers where zero is meant to be the bottom bounds of the group. And then at the very top, you will always have something that's pointing to that um, thing that's the lowest. And if the last value is pointing to the thing that's the lowest, then you can be certain that it is actually the largest number in the group. So you can kind of think of the, you're kind of, you're inserting into this series of pointers that is actually a ring and the group will always be closed. Um, that's the intuition behind having um, zero, zero at the end here and having um, zero at the start. But anyway, when we insert 30, you can see that we update the pointers in the value immediately of the lower, below it, which is zero, to points at 30. So if I, as I just said, if I can provide a membership proof of something that has the value zero and the next value of 30, I can be sure that from the values one through 29 don't exist in the tree. So if I was to insert value 10, like I am now, 
I first would provide a non-membership proof for this leaf. I can be then be certain that 10 doesn't exist in the tree. And when I ever want to go insert 10, I update the pointers in the value below. So now I've inserted into the index two, the value 10, and I've updated this value to show that. And the next immediate value or the immediately higher value from 10 is 30. So it points to 30. So now using this leaf, I could provide a non-membership for 20, which I do here. And then if I insert 20, I want to update to this, the lower node to point to 20, and then 20 itself will point at what this was previously pointing out, which was 30. So that's, that's the intuition for inserting into the tree. Um, so let's talk about doing an inclusion proof. There, Precisely as they used to be, but you need to know the full node data this time. You can't just have the value and hash, just hash the value and then prove that it exists in the tree. You actually have to hash the, in, the entire node itself. So you have to hash value next index with next value. And then you just perform a normal inclusion proof that we saw before. So we have this pair that then hashes up to this pair, that hashes up to this pair, that hashes up to our known, our known root. So non-membership proofs. I've just talked about them, but this is the main optimization. Recall from earlier, um, well, I've already spoiled this, but if a tree is well formed, we can be certain that nothing exists within value and next value. Um, if they were, then when we would have updated the pointers. And you can kind of see that in, in this case, that like I can't provide a proof that 30 doesn't exist because there's no nodes here which have a range that 30 would exist in, non-inclusive, of course. So let's quickly do an example non-membership for the value 35. So first, I want to search for the value that's immediately below 35. And in that case, it will be this node here, 30, 40, 50, 30 and 4, and 50. I prove the inclusion of this node by providing a hash path for it, and then Hopefully my circuit will accept it. And then once I've proven that this node exists, I can basically just check, is the value itself less than the value I'm trying to prove non-membership for, 35? Yes, then this is true. If I am trying to prove that 50 is greater than 35, which is here, which is true, and then grant, pass the check. And then I basically, as I've just said, do the inclusion of this leaf. And that is enough for me to be certain that 35 doesn't exist within the tree. So yeah, just highlighting again, this is this is the comparison that you're doing. So this is what I've just also talked about already. I've jumped the gun. <laughs> um, if I want to insert 35, I just do the non-membership check and then add 35. And then as you can see that Altogether, this was only two Merkle membership proofs, as was the case with previous insertions. Um, and that's only going to be 64 hashes if you're in a 32 deep tree instead of 256. And that is the main optimization that we have. But there is another, and is that we can actually do batch insertions. So as this is an appendently tree, we know what indexes we're going to be inserting multiple values into. If you had a sparse, membership tree and you had a range of nullifiers which were all very they're random and they're different from each other you can't insert them you can't insert them efficiently or in batches like by inserting an entire subtree because they're at random different points in the tree and you can't really do a batch insertion if the values that you're trying to insert don't live within the same subtree but in this case because you know that there are all going to be in series you can't so for example, I'm just going to show what a batch insertion would look like. So let's say we have the state that our tree was in previously, and we're going to try and insert 30, 50, 16, 15, 35 even. So I'm going to prepare our batch insertion subtree here. Um, I've kind of blocked it off here to kind of show that we have, we're not going to insert it just yet, but this is kind of the pending subtree that we're going to be inserting. First, I'm going to update the low node for 35. to so. 30 is going to point to 35 because it's the immediate well, low nullifier or low node. I then am going to update 50's low node. Um, 
this exists within our pending insertion subtree, so it's pretty cheap to do. And then do the same for 60, and then do the same for 15, so that would update the leaf over here. And then I can just build this subtree and then insert this subtree all at once. So instead of having to update the root every time I insert one of these, I just update the root every time I insert a pointer. It's over here, and then I can just insert this whole subtree at once. So it's amazing for circuit performance because we're doing a lot less hashing, but there is a trade-off, and it's that there has to be a node that can provide all of these, um, well, where all of these low nullifiers are. And let's say you're inserting a random value into the tree, Realistically, if well, in the naive case, you would have to do an exhaustive search of all tree nodes to find the node that you're trying to insert, um, or the lone nullifier node for the node you're trying to insert, which isn't great. But you can just store some kind of lookup table that links um, or sort your the nodes in some other data structure that the node will take um, care of to basically increase this performance. So you're not doing a linear search over everything. Um, Okay, so that's an overview of all the trees that we'll be using in, in Aztec. Um, we're going to talk about the trees that were in Aztec Connect. So as I said earlier, we have in classic private state um, applications, we have a couple of append-only trees that we always add new data, to, true, new data to, and then we have a nullifier tree to basically spend our notes and delete them. So this is a, a visualization of what all the trees in Asset Connect look like. So we have a data tree that then has a data roots tree that it commits to. And I'll talk about why, why you need this. We then have a nullifier tree and then the DeFi tree, which stored all the interactions. And any time a DeFi interaction was spent, you add something to the nullifier tree. Every time, and you can see that they're all here with the DeFi notes and the claim notes. And then every time, um, a user interaction or a transfer was done and spent, you also add them to the nullifier tree. So what is this data root tree? The idea is you need it to combat race conditions. So in our private state applications, users are creating proofs on their device. It's not all being done by the sequencer at one point in time, like would happen in Ethereum when you're ordering a block. The block builder would, would know the insertions to be doing inside Ethereum's Merkle tree. Um, and it would know what state to prove against. Whenever your users are doing these proofs themselves, the root of the data tree, whenever they create their proof, may be different to the root of the data tree whenever the sequencer comes to bundle their transaction. So with every block, this root will change. If you produce your proof against one block that's in the past, the sequencer is still able to accept your transaction if it's able to find the root at the time you made your proof inside the roots tree. So it's just a way that allows the sequencer to accept transactions that were created against steel roots. And whenever it's private data, you don't have to worry about multiple people spending those notes because only one person can. And if a transaction came in before from the same person that spends that number, it would exist in the nullifier tree and be rejected. But you can be certain that the root did, it, the leaf did exist at some point in time using this model. So for anything that can be consumed by in, can be consumed by the user on their device, you're going to have to have this root tree to keep track of previous roots. So ASIC three or just ASIC nine has a lot more trees. As you can see, we're doing a lot more complex things. There isn't just contract, there isn't just DeFi interactions and transfers. There's this concept of storing contracts on chain and L1 messages and public data and all that kind of stuff. So this is what the trees in Aztec look like. And there's a lot more of them, but all of them kind of serve a very similar purpose. Uh, to the ones that existed within Asset Connect, and they're they're very similar. So we have the private data tree that existed in Asset Connect on the root tree. We then have the L1 to L2 messages, so we can support arbitrary message passing. 
We have our nullifier trees. We now have this new one, which is a public data tree, which is a sparse Merkle tree. And it's basically just to, to model updatable state. So it doesn't have the same problem that we had for private state where we need to keep track of a nullifier tree to update values. In the public state tree, everyone can see it. We don't care that people can link transactions together in this case because the user is deciding to make it public. Um, so we can just do updates in place in this tree. And then we have the contract tree that basically tells us that um, the contract that you've created a proof for does actually exist and that it has certain functions and we'll dive into that slightly in a second. So here we are, the contract tree. This is a model taken from Zexy um, as a way to basically prove that the contract you're interacting with does exist and that the function that you're using does exist without revealing that the function you're using, what function you are interacting with. So this, this looks very complicated, but conceptually it, it's not too, not too tricky to wrap the head around. So a noir contract in ASEC 3, well, ASEC is just a group of functions. And that is kind of shown over here. We have a tree of functions that are valid for a certain contract. So we have the function selector, the data about it. We have the verification key for that. So that's what allows us to, to verify the smart proofs that the user creates. And there will be a series of these that make up this kind of function tree inside a contract. We then have a contract address and a portal that's linked on L1 that kind of get hashed together to give us our contract leaf. And then we just have a tree of contracts. So this looks very complicated, but it's really just a contract has a set of functions and an address. We hash those together to give us a leaf in the contract tree. And then we have lots of different contracts that all have this inside of them. And that's what goes into our contract tree. So another challenge that we got to combat is the size of our nullifier trees. So they can get pretty big, um, especially as your protocol goes on. And you're, especially since every single interaction that you're doing ends up creating nullifiers. So say you're spending messages, you're um, consuming state. Um, you're going to start adding adding things to the nullifier tree. So every transaction really is going to just be creating data for nodes to take care of. And um, there's been very interesting research done by well the Polygon Lighting team and some of Valak's work on our own state of expiry that it goes into an idea of splitting up nullifier trees into these things called epochs. And as I've just said, consuming data from a pendently tree ends up adding to your nullifier tree, so it's going to get pretty big. And here's just an example of Zcash and its recent blockchain size. And a lot of this has been caused by somebody able to cheaply create nullifiers. Um, so it's really something you got to prepare for to, make, well, to try and combat the size of your nullifier tree getting too big for node operators because and you also could have some economics and that the pricing of creation of these nullifiers is, is too expensive to do some form of DDoS attack, but it is definitely something to take care of or even think very carefully about. Um, and then we have Asset Connect. It, it had a massive, ever-growing state size um, that, well, was becoming an engineering problem as well. And Asset Connect has been sunset recently. So as I've just said, we want to limit the state of our, the, well, the growth of our nullifier tree. And the way we do that is by having these things called prunable epochs. And the idea of a prunable epoch is that the node itself doesn't actually need to store the nullifier tree. It can group them all up, store the root at some point in time, and then the users themselves will be responsible for proving that some nullifier doesn't exist within X amount of epochs. So every single piece of data that's created in ASIC will have the, null, the epoch that it's created as hashed inside of it. So then if you want to spend that note or consume it, you will basically have to provide a non-membership proof between the epoch it was created and the epoch that it's in, well, that you're in now. 
Um, so here's just kind of something to give you a quick intuition because it sounds very fancy. Realistically, it's, it's not too fancy. So let's say we have a nullifier tree that we've just gone over the index tree and we have some kind of epoch tree. As time goes on, stuff will get added to the nullifier tree. And then whenever we progress an epoch, we take the nullifier tree at a certain point in time and we add it in to this basically previous epoch tree. The node, well, this basically compresses this entire nullifier tree to just be a single hash in this epoch tree. So the node can then store this hash, store this root, delete this, and then it'll be up to some other provider to index this or up to the users to store their own epochs or store the epoch of the, um, the leaf that they would like to consume. And then as you can see, as time goes on, our nullifier tree fills up. We progress an epoch, we store that in the epoch tree, and our nullifier tree goes back to being smaller. So yeah, as I've just said, all created nodes have to be tied to an epoch in order to prove non-membership. In the current epoch, you will basically have to prove non-membership in all the epochs that have come since. And this does sound quite scary, quite, exp quite expensive, but hopefully via some clever recursion and maybe folding schemes or something like that, we can get the cost of doing all these proofs done for the user. And it won't be too bad. And we can strike some form of compromise between what's reasonable for a node and what's reasonable for a user. Um, so there are some, as I said, some data availability issues with this. And these are all kind of open questions and infrastructure that we will probably have to create. Um, nodes will not store the past trees. They will just store the roots. So a user will have to know this information or another third party will need to provide it for them. Um, or another type of, maybe some type of archive node in a way. And this is very similar to what um, a stateless Ethereum would look like in general. And it might be something that people will have to deal with um, or come to terms, not, not necessarily deal with, but it may be the new normal as time goes on to basically limit state growth. Um, and there are ways that you can request all of these previous paths. Um, maybe you could do some kind of OMR stuff where the server that's providing you this information doesn't know what it's giving you. And this is very, very interesting areas of research, private data information retrieval. Um, another slight, slight issue is that each node is tied to a nullifier tree. Um, well, each, each node is tied to an epoch. So you can slightly, it slightly reduces the size of your anonymity sets. Um, a way to get around this is allow you to, to claim membership in a range of epochs and maybe dilute this set. But if, you're not, if your epochs are sufficiently large, this, this isn't something really to worry about, but it is something to be wary of. And um, thanks for watching. That's uh, hopefully everything you need to know about trees. Um, yeah, thank you.